And these are our two, uh, Eric Smith, Ali Irvine, our, our graduates this year, uh, Eric from high school and Ali from college. But we're choosing to honor them when we can be back in in-person worship. And, and uh, they, I don't know if they like coming up front, but we just want to really love on you guys and congratulate you for all that you've accomplished in your lives. And uh, we just love you and we want to do it special. And so it'll probably be sometime in July. We're looking forward to going uh, in person, back to in-person worship and we we'll look forward to that time. But we want to honor you just as well today and let you know how proud we are as your church family of you and uh, the things that you'll be doing in the future. So we're excited for all that you've been able to do in your life thus far. Well, let's continue to worship the Lord with the giving of our tithes and offerings. And I want to pray over those things in just a moment. Um, I, I want you to know that your faithful giving every week is just unbelievable. And we're just thankful that we're able to continue to keep up with the costs. We ask you to continue. Uh, to, to make that a blessing. Um, we had uh, giving two weeks ago was like near 6,000, 2,000 over our budget. And then the next week was under 3,000. So we were about $1,000 under budget. And so those things balance each other out. But this much we know. We have been able to keep up with the costs of this ministry. And we first of all say thank you God because it's all His, right? And we thank you for your faithfulness and obedience to God. To bring your first fruits to him. Remember that you can give your tithe, you can give your offering through the uh, mail, you can mail it into the office and our people, they just take it and put it in the right place depending on who gets the mail and then uh, and then you can also give online. About Probably about a third of our giving now is uh, right through our website. So you can go to uh, bluewaterfmchurch.com and, uh, and give there. And so either way you want to give is fine. Uh, if you want to, don't drop cash off to the parsonage. Uh, it may not make it to the church. I'm just kidding. Uh, let's pray over the offering this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your people and for the invitation that you give us. This is one of those special times. So many of us know the joy, the joy of giving. And Lord, in the midst of this pandemic and being online for our services versus being in person, it just, it means even more when our people are so faithful. But Lord, that just reminds us of your faithfulness. You are the one that takes care of us. You're the one that helps us pay our bills at home. You're the one that brings us our workplaces and however monies might come into a home, whether it's through a pension or through Social Security, whatever those sources are, you are still the provider. And we say thank you. And we glorify you for it. Receive this offering of love from us as we give faithfully to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now you probably have your elements prepared, but we're going to do communion just after the message, as we sometimes do here in the service. So I'm going to I begin to preach the word now, and uh, but be ready for the communion a little later. If you haven't prepared your elements yet, uh, maybe just these first couple minutes of the sermon, you can grab some juice or some crackers or some bread in your home and be prepared for communion a little bit later in the service. We hope that you can participate with us. Well, we're in, in Acts chapter 5. And I pick up with verse 17, right where we left off last week. I, I find it interesting, uh, often, I find it interesting when God lands us in a passage that is perfectly formed for the day, almost to the day. We have had one of the most unusual weeks. Just right when we're in the middle of a pandemic, we have another thing that comes along. And of course, when George Floyd was was his life was taken from him inappropriately and as arrests were made it has created a, a, a fury around the country hasn't it and our response in the last week week and a half has been important what we say at some of the most crucial times in our lives it, it, it says everything about who we are 
And uh, I, for one, have had to figure out how as a Christian and also as a pastor, how do I respond? How do I exemplify for our congregation and for my own family and for my relationship with God? What do I say in the middle of uh, some of the most horrific things that happen in our world? A life was taken. And we've begun to look at how one section of our country, one section of humanity, the, back, the black population, and what we're to do uh, with responding appropriately to what we have, so many of us have called the injustices of life. And this certainly was an injustice. Well, I came to this passage and I just, as I read it, I was just like, Lord, you're not going to make me preach that. And yet, that is exactly what God has for us today. So if you turn in your scriptures to Acts chapter 5 and beginning with verse 17, we're going to read through the end of the chapter. It's, it's a good 24, 25 verses, but you've got to hear this. And as I read this, I want you to think about what God asks you and me to do in the midst of people who oppress us. Now, we can discuss, and we will discuss a little bit later about who the real oppressor is on a given day. And it sure seems to move just a little bit. But, uh, but that's a whole other matter. But let's get into God's Word. Let's read what He has to say to us. This is Paul's uh, writing, I'm sorry, uh, Luke's writing in the book of Acts uh, to the church. Beginning with verse 17, Acts chapter 5. Then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. Let me back up. i got to tell you, in verse 16, just before that, it says the clouds, the crowd gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, and catch this, bringing their sick and those tormented by the impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Now, when you think about all of them being healed, it helps to explain Verse 17, and I meant to say that a moment ago. Then the high priest and all his associates, verse 17, were, uh, and the members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. Everybody was getting healed, and they were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles. They put them in public jail. They wanted everybody to know. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts and tell the people about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and the, and when the high priest and the associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. Now, don't miss this. The, uh, the apostles showed up at daybreak, right at dawn, it says. And then the priest and the Sanhedrin, they arrived when it was time to come into the office kind of thing. Maybe eight, maybe nine, who knows? And so they're coming a bit later. They don't know. It's clear that they don't know that the apostles are right there in the courtyard, probably the side of the temple that they didn't bother to check. It wasn't next to the place where the pastors parked, you know, the pastor's parking spot. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. But, but they did not see them. I think I'm at verse 22. But arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there, so they went back and reported. Verse 23 now. We found the jail securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the guard and the chief priest were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, look, the men you, are, you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders, they say, to not teach in his name. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostle, apostles replied, We must obey God more than human beings, rather than human beings. We're going to come back to that phrase, aren't we? We must obey God rather than human beings. 
the God of our ancestors, raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on the cross. God exalted him in his, to his right hand as the prince and savior that he might bring savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. I found this portion very interesting, that Gamaliel would be part of the Sanhedrin and he, he had enough influence that he literally put the men outside and had a hearing with the Sanhedrin. I don't think we should miss that. There was influence there. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do with these men. I'm at verse 36 now. Some time ago, uh, a Thutius appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and his followers were scattered. Therefore, in this present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. I find that an interesting statement by a member of the Sanhedrin. Let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only bind yourselves fighting against God. It makes me, as I read this, I wanted to think through of all the things I've ever tried to do in ministry and wondered why some of them failed. Maybe God didn't really ask us after all to do certain things that we do. It's just, just a thought for the heart. His speech persuaded them. Verse 40. They called the apostles in, and don't miss this, and had them flogged. And then they ordered them to not speak in the name of Jesus. And they let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin, rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgraced for the name. Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as I read this word today, a part of me goes, there is just so little to preach because it preaches itself. Lord, you, you have just grabbed a hold of our hearts this morning. And in the middle of uh, all of the rioting, Lord, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And then we have on top of this, the riots and the, the things that are going on. And we just are like, we're beside ourselves in so many ways. Lord, what a world we live in today. But Lord, your word is here now. And we ask that it would be applied to our hearts. That we would somehow dig into it just a bit and pull from it the teachings that you would have for us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you standing for the right cause? It says in verse 16, just before our text, that the Sanhedrin was filled with jealousy. First question. Is there jealousy in the land today? Is there jealousy? Is there jealousy in Congress? Yeah, yeah. Is there jealousy in the church? Hmm? How about a convicting heart? We jumped a long ways from Congress to the church, didn't we? How about our families? I know there's jealousy among most siblings. We try to put it down, don't we? But there's jealousy, there's competition. Back and forth, the apostles have moved into and out of Solomon's colonnade. For some time now, the apostles have been praying at the temple. The temple-bound beggar was healed of his lame legs at the temple gate called Beautiful. We talked about that, didn't we? This healing, although only one of hundreds, was so obvious that it provoked these temple leaders. Back and forth, the Sanhedrin questioned, arrested, and threatened the apostles. One of the things that provokes so much attention, though, and even offense with the temple leaders, is the number of people that were now joining this apostolic movement. People were, were selling their property and sharing on levels that would make our heads spin, even 
today. Everybody was in need was getting their stimulus check. There you go. <laughs> and when money becomes part of a movement, when money starts to flow, guess who gets interested? The Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Because you see, they had their manipulative ways that Jesus even addressed in his time. We should be concerned when the church becomes most concerned about money. Don't forget that. We find ourselves once again at the temple courts with this mass of people who are gathering every day. This was offensive to the Sanhedrin, and it was a general concern for the city of Jerusalem. Right in verse 17, it says that the Sadducees were jealous. So they arrested the apostles, they put them in jail, and during the night, of course, an angel comes and releases them and tells them to go to the temple courts to tell the good news, to tell the good news again. So there's a conflict with the Sanhedrin. There's a conflict with the community, potentially. And even there's a conflict with the secular authorities. What does that sound like? Does it sound like the last week and a half of our life? It does to me. Sounds like some of the marches and riots we've had in the last two weeks. People are very angry right now about what's going on. Sometimes it's hard to tell what people are really angry about, right? So what's the difference between the recent marches, the recent riots, and the recent demonstrations and compared to what the apostles are doing in this temple court? Some would say it's the same. Interesting point. Here's some questions, though, that we might want to ask to dissect what's really going on these days. And I want to stay with what's going on in our world right now. You see, first of all, a black man has been murdered by a white police officer. Is it okay to speak up and, not only, and say not only is this a horrible crime, but it is also a reflection that racism is far from over in this country? I believe racism was committed in that act, personally. But even if it wasn't, it has raised the racism card, hasn't it? It really has, and we've got to face that. Two, is it right to march with others and say we stand together against racism? I think the place can be right. I ended up in a march Thursday myself, one that was, uh, one that was Sponsored is the word by the NAACP. Uh, Kevin Watkins is my neighbor, lives just up the street. He's the president of NAACP and a friend of Harbor Impact. He has volunteered here dozens of times and actually uh, drove the bus the last few times when uh, people would be brought to Harbor Impact. I wanted to be supportive, not just of him, but I knew I could trust him. And so I marched. Uh, Operation Transformation sponsored the, the march as well. So uh, I was like, what do I do? What do I do? Because I'm kind of a careful person in that sense. And I was deeply convicted that I had to go, and I did. I felt like I was representing our church. I hope I was. And so we marched from the, the canopy near the river on SC4 campus over to the city hall and listened to speakers. We, we listened to a mother grieve over the things that she fears for her children, who were not killed, but she fears for her children, and so many more. But there's a third question I want to ask before we move on. Is it okay to riot and to create civil disobedience while at the same time trying to make our point? You wonder with the riots, right, what is the real point? I certainly I think there are a lot of ulterior motives to a lot of what's going on around us. How do we know when to react? We each have difficult decisions to make. But I believe this passage is walking us right into a counsel for how to handle that, how to handle this kind of decision-making time. All I'm, in, all I'm saying so far is that these three things are very different motivations for, all, for every one of us. We must stand up and call racism what it is and be one voice that demands all citizens of our country 
and the world, for that matter, be counted the same, valued the same, and live in a safe and affirming society. When I was writing this, I, I thought, I feel like I'm presenting a, a congressional presentation, but I believe this belongs in the church as well. Let me give you one more application to this passage before we get back into it. Because of the COVID-19 virus epidemic, we've been asked to stay at home and shelter in place for some time. We've been ordered to shut our doors physically and not, and not hold public in-service services. As, as time has gone on since early March, many have rebelled against the governor's orders and done what they've wanted or were convicted to do, if you will. Is the governor right in ordering churches to not use public buildings? We, like many other churches, began online services so we could reach out to our people and our community. And we're doing so right now, aren't we? Yes. Some churches sued the governor to say that the church does not have the right to keep churches from meeting in churches. And the governor backed down and, and said, okay, uh, this won't be held against people who assemble in churches. Hmm. So the governor, upon her counsel, said that no one would be arrested. So what does that mean uh, to abide by the governor's orders? On paper, yes, we, we can meet if, if we want. It would be law-abiding, so it wouldn't be against God's words, so to speak. So does that, um, but do we find it prudent prudent to continue to shelter in place as a church. And our leadership has, has gathered and our conference has uh, given us counsel and we've decided that we should wait. And so we are. Oh, I don't, I don't fault other churches for doing what they're feeling convicted to do. Um, the, the fact that that would create lack of unity, I have no peace in my spirit that I have a place to say others are wrong and I'm right. We're just making our decision because we made our decision. Our leadership has said, yes, we will wait. See, here's the part that I want to make sure that we don't under misunderstand. The governor has not told us we cannot worship God. <laughs> Please hear that. For instance, uh, she has not said we cannot meet as a church online. Otherwise, this would be shut down. We would be shut down. Facebook would not allow us to do this. Her order... And her desire has been to protect us from the COVID-19. I, I tell you, if I was governor, I, I'm sure that no matter what decision I would make, people would question my motives. I don't know our governor's motives, but I know this. She's our governor. And our president is our president. And we need to do our best to live within the confines. But there's more to it than this, and I'll move on. So every church in our state has to make their decision how they're to follow these orders. And so we've continued to socially distance. And we hope that it is the key to saving countless lives. I believe it is. I believe it is. Some of the strategies that the experts have given us um, have been effective, then ineffective. Sometimes we're to wear masks, sometimes we're not. Sometimes, you know, it's been all over the map, hasn't it? you got two doctors who we say, listen to the doctors. And then you say, which one? Right? Okay. Do we wear a mask? Do we wear gloves? Do we stay at home? When do we reopen businesses? These are debatable strategies. But we, and we must work through them. But in the end, the real issue is, and the important part, is how will we move forward together? Let's go back to the text of our passage. So the apostles are arrested, put in jail, released by an angel, and then told, get this, told to go back and do again the same thing they got arrested for. When is it right to be arrested for doing what God tells you to do? Hmm. Do you see the civil disobedience that God called the apostles to commit? When we do what we do in society, we must have God's very best in mind. I love verse 29 again. It gives us this debatable statement. We must obey God and not human beings. We need to be careful these days not to equate this statement with every example I've shared today. 
The context here is simple. The Sanhedrin was rejecting the very Son of God. Do not miss that. They weren't talking about where and when they could worship. They were talking about whether Jesus was the Son of God or not. And that's a whole different thing. And would you be willing to go to jail for that? I hope I would. I think I would. Verse 33 says, when they heard this, when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put the apostles to death. But then walks in a thoughtful, level-headed Pharisee. A man who would not be in the position he was if he believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Don't miss that. He would have no hearing that day in Sanhedrin if there was even a hint of affirming Jesus. Do you wonder what Gamaliel's motive was? Chances are he was protecting the future of the Sanhedrin. We don't know. But what we do know is that he used his, his prudent argument that caused the release of the apostles. His argument? <laughs> it's one even we as Christians should heed. He said, if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. Hmm. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. Gamaliel was preaching the good news right in that moment. You will not be able to stop these men. That's powerful. You will find yourselves fighting against God. He equated that if in fact they were right, you'd be fighting against God. It was a prophetic word then, and it's a prophetic word now. As we pledge ourselves against human suffering, against injustice, against poverty and the like, we had better know this day what grieves the Lord's heart or not. We've got to know that. We have to be discerners of the Word of God, as Denise read in the Scriptures earlier. The Word of God pouring into our life so that we know the truth. We have to know the difference. I mean, if I'm going to die for God's kingdom's sake, I want it to be for declaring Jesus is the Christ, not some edict that says we can or can't have services at certain times. If this were more of a battle between a governor and our churches, our online services right now, like I said, would not even be functioning. So I want to close our time with this. Three important elements to be men and, women, men and women who are willing to die for the right thing. Listen to this now. If you're going to die for the right cause, you need to have courage. You need to have courage. You've got to be courageous people. We, we are living in a day that Christians should be courageous. We should rise up and have courage. I wasn't quite sure that I was doing I was sure I was doing the right thing, but I didn't know how to do the right thing. And you know, if you're not careful, if you take too long to decide how to do the, the courageous thing, then the courage will leak out. And I decided in my heart this week, I just had to do it. I wasn't sure I would do it right. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not so sure that I'm using all the perfect words today. But they still have to be said. That's courage. You see, the apostles went straight back and committed the same act that landed them in jail. Barclay, in his commentary, he calls this action reckless boldness. In, in a holy sense of the word, we need to be reckless and bold. Mm. But if you're going to die for the right cause, secondly, versus courage, the second, you need to know your principles. What is it for you? What are your principles? Is God first? Is God first? So many in this world, God is not first. Two questions we often ask, according to Barclay again. He says, this is our choice. Is the course of action safe? Or is it what God wants me to do? Which, which are you going to choose? Sometimes the course of action, it might be safe, according to God. Sometimes it may not be as safe as we'd like it to be. You better know your principles. And number three, if you're going to die for the right cause, you need to have a clear view of your purpose. Do you have a clear view of your purpose? And that brings us to communion this morning. 
The apostles knew this was a watershed moment. You'd better know you have all three of these right. The result? For the apostles having it right was 39 lashes. They were flogged. Don't miss that. The apostles were flogged. That means 40 stripes minus one. 40 stripes means you're dead. They were given a flogging and then released. Wow. I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm supposed to say Black Lives Matter. I found some, some, some information this week that there's some organization that represents Black Lives Matter. And I didn't agree with much of what it proposed. But I tell you what, I had no trouble when I was marching saying Black Lives Matter. Because they do. And whether you say all lives matter or black lives matter, dear friends, right now we have a house that's on fire. There's a house that's on fire. We better put the water on the house that's burning. We need to be very realistic about what, God, what kind of position God's given us in this life. And so as we, as we close now and as we move into the communion session of our, of our service, know this. God wants you to make a difference in your world. Whether you march in your home or out in the community, I'm simply telling you that sometimes God calls you to do something that might just get you arrested. Don't let it be a riot. Don't do that. But let your life count. And make sure that people are catching you saying the things that should be said. That Jesus is Lord. That Jesus is Lord for all. That our lives matter. That black lives matter. That God matters. Let's remember these things. Don't forget them. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that in this service now, as we transition to communion, we know that we need to prepare our hearts. We need to prepare our hearts in such a way that we might be ready, even in this communion service, to say the right things. I pray this in your name. Amen.